I'm combining a couple of uh, papers, reports here. This one just came out in Science as a feature, talking about breathless oceans, warming oceans are running short of oxygen, and the fiercest marine predators are already feeling the effects. Sharks feed around low oxygen regions because the low oxygen waters that remain just below the surface tend to push the prey together, then it's easier for them to find and hunt them. Uh, so that's a picture of uh, some Spanish scientists off Canary Islands doing some research. They basically catch them, they tag them, uh, and uh, we'll see a figure here, for example, sea changes, low oxygen zones that form where currents concentrate depleted water along the western edges of the continents have grown over the past half century. Migratory blue and short fin mako sharks tagged with tracking devices showed a preference for a large patch of low oxygen water off the northwest coast of Africa, perhaps because it confines their prey in shallow waters. That's a hypothesis. So we are looking at shark paths and how they uh, come down and hunt in the low oxygen waters. So the colors here we are looking at uh, dissolved oxygen at 100 meter depth in milliliters per liters. Uh, as you know from basic oceanography the uh, concentration drops below about 5 milliliters per liter. We call them uh, hypoxic waters and if it drops below 2 milliliter per liter, we call them anoxic waters, and there is a bit of a breeze here through the window. Very hot summer day, but uh, breeze is nice because I don't run the AC. I'll see if the sound is okay or not. Uh, as you know from Gulf of places like Gulf of Mexico, the Mediterranean, various other places, eutrophication and runoff from land use and deforestation, urbanization, agriculture, etc create seasonal deoxygenation or hypoxic anoxic regions in many places which have trended because of increasing human activities and loadings in the rivers because of the floodplains being used for other human uses and so on. Uh, nonetheless, here we are talking about global warming which obviously increases CO2 and causes ocean acidification which we have talked about elsewhere. There is a feedback between CO2 increase, the warming and the stratification changes, how the ocean gets ventilated so that it can take oxygen from the atmosphere and move it down into deeper parts of the ocean and so on. Uh, in a natural process, uh, let me uh, stop, close the window here because the winds are Okay, sorry about that. Uh, hopefully the noise reduced. So we know from natural processes that oxygen is on average, this is the mean oxygen for the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Oxygen near the surface is high because it's constantly being exchanged with the atmosphere and the ocean waters near the surface have high oxygen and there is also photosynthesis from phytoplankton in many places. As you go down uh, Below the surface, uh, you see that the oxygen drops and we have the so-called oxygen minimum layer where a lot of the heterotrophic species live and they respire uh, and they consume the uh, oxygen and create this. And there is a an acute reason why it increases again uh, below the surface because there is water sinking in the North Atlantic which brings down oxygen with it. So you can see that the Atlantic oxygen is much higher than the Pacific oxygen uh, below the surface, dissolved oxygen. And Pacific has older waters but still you can see that its deeper waters also increase a little bit compared to the oxygen minimum zone which again has something to do with this trop uh, global thermohaline circulation which I have talked about elsewhere. Keeping that in mind, these are naturally occurring low oxygen waters which relate to upwelling which brings up the oxygen minimum water uh, towards 100 meter depth. and. The question is with global warming, are these thickening in their extent in the vertical and expanding in the horizontal? There are many examples from the Oregon waters here which are getting deoxygenated and jellyfish come in when that happens because many of the uh, species that require oxygen get pushed out. Jellyfish can manage with lower oxygen and they compete better in a low nutrient, low oxygen environment and so on. So the jellyfish <coughs> population has generally expanded as well. 
Okay, so those are the related issues. Uh, fr coming back to the science feature article, troubled waters, average oxygen levels in the ocean have fallen by 2% over the past 50 years and could fall 20% by the end of this century, making some parts of the oceans less habitable to sea life. Seems obvious and the paper also argues that people are paying a lot of attention to ocean acidification. Its impacts are being seen in some places but the argument here is that deoxygenation is going much faster and it's having a bigger impact and could be a bigger concern as we go forward. So coastal regions which are particularly vulnerable to nutrient runoff, sediment loading and deoxygenation uh, are being looked at here as well as the open ocean. Nutrients such as synthetic fertilizer fuel so-called dead zones, deep water with little or no oxygen, the largest uh, in the B Baltic Sea can cover an area of the size of Ireland. Okay, so here greenhouse gas emissions contribute to increased atmospheric temperatures as we go into the open ocean. So runoff of nutrients can create dead zones as I mentioned here and you get degraded organic matter falling and deep waters with low oxygen spread out away from the coast towards the open ocean. The processes 1, 2, 3 and 4 are shown here, biomass production. Nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphate, phosphorus are flushed into coastal water sparking algae blooms. The algae blooms are so large that the zooplankton cannot grow in time to chow them down, graze them down. So you have uh, dead matter sinking, dead photosynthesized matter sinking and aerobic uh, microbes eating it and consuming the oxygen and creating large regions of dead zones where the oxygen can fall below 5 milliliters per liter or even 2 milliliters per liter. Those fish that can swim can run away but the shellfish and others bottom dwellers which cannot move end up dying in large numbers. Uh, naturally also in the uh, off the the Anguilla Beng Benguela Angola dome we have uh, naturally occurring annual deoxygenation which ends up with millions of dead fish on the beach for example. Second here dead zone uh, the algae dies and sinks to the bottom where microbes feast on it and consume oxygen. In th the three here 200 to 800 meter the oxygen minimum zone expansion. So we are having expanded minimum oxygen zones which are affectionately known as OMZs OMZs, OMZ is closer to OMG, so OMZs are going to be OMG pretty soon. As oxygen levels fall in the ocean, regions that are now naturally low in oxygen because of current patterns are expanding vertically. Their area also grew by some 4.5 million square kilometers over the past half century. In four compressed habitats, so as these OMZs grow, they threaten to displace fish that seek more oxygen rich waters near the surface. There are concerns this could make them more vulnerable to overfishing. So f ships are hanging around and trying to catch fish so they may soon begin to put their lines and nets deeper over the oxygen minimum zones which are expanding upwards and catch more fish. Okay, So in terms of processes coming back to here we have sun's energy and greenhouse gases affecting the ocean warming. Ocean warming creates stronger stratification as well which makes mixing harder which also then makes uh, the oxygenation of the waters lower. So increased oxy oxygen release can happen at the surface, solubility impacts as as well as the impacts of uh, you know changes in the ecosystem. So low oxygen deep waters, deeper waters being shown here. These are of Gra uh, Gran Canaria, one of the Canary Islands. A small fishing boat is carried, he's carrying a team of scientists hoping to tag sharks swimming towards an expanding low oxygen zone. So this tough work and data is collected diligently over time to try to track these things. To add a few more details I'm taking some material from an older report from UNESCO and partners uh, which was titled The Ocean is Losing Its Breath Declining Oxygen in the World's Ocean and Coastal Waters. This is from 2018, a bit dated but the uh, fundamentals are still the same. So some deoxygenation numbers and effects. So these are OMZs in blue and 
areas with coastal hypoxia in red so these are related to the eutrophication or enhanced nutrient flow that we just talked about uh, this is from some papers that are mentioned here so including oxygen uh, effects from Killing and Garcia, Diaz and Rosenberg, Carton Carstensen and so on okay so what are the processes during the past 50 years the area of low oxygen water in the open ocean has increased by 4.5 million square kilometers that we just mentioned world's oceans are now losing approximately one gigaton of oxygen each year okay there is a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere but there is very little oxygen in the ocean. There is very little CO2 in the atmosphere, even though it's important as a greenhouse gas, but there is a lot of CO2 in the ocean. So we have to remember these. So deoxygenation is important because there's already little dissolved oxygen available. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment released by the United Nations in 2005 reported that supply of nitrogen containing compounds input uh, into the world's oceans grew by 80% from 1860 to 1990. For individual coastal water bodies, the increase has been as high as 100 fold or more. Okay, that's something to remember. And there are obviously some hotspots along here in the Gulf of Mexico and the east coast of the US and all over the Mediterranean as well as the Black Sea uh, and uh, you have, sorry, North Sea, Mediterranean. Uh, Indian Ocean. There are some unique physics circulations that matter here as well. One of the largest naturally occurring oxygen minimum zone is here in the Ara Arabian Sea and so on. But you can see that all coasts are generally hot spots. Uh, upwelling of low oxygen waters can cause massive fish kills but also bring nutrient rich waters to the surface to fuel fisheries production. Deoxygenation alters the goods and services delivered by marine ecosystems for humans. Services reduced can include food production through fisheries and aquaculture, climate regulation, nutrient cycling and resilience. Okay. The Baltic Sea has the largest coastal water hypoxic zone. In 2011, the area of water with dissolved oxygen concentrations less than 2 mg per liter was nearly 80,000 square kilometers. Over 500 coastal ocean bodies, coastal water bodies, now report dissolved oxygen concentrations below 22 milligrams per liter. This is from Diaz. I think that is 22, but please check if maybe 2.2. 22 seems very high. Okay, so you understand the various issues involved here, but you can also see again the processes. Warming from more abundant greenhouse gases creates uh, stratification changes and mixing changes in the ocean. Coastal regions are much more vulnerable to deoxygenation, but deeper oceans are catching up because the warming in the deeper ocean is expanding as well in depth and in width and so on. So there are heat, sur heat flux exchanges between land and ocean. So you have the estuary, shelf and open ocean here. You have 0% oxygen, so 0 to 100% oxygen. So you have saturation here, some increase uh, with the various processes, oxygen minim minimum zone that we talked about. So generally winds and mixing tend to be stronger in the coastal regions, but as you head towards the open ocean, depends on where you are. In the subtropical gyres, it's uh, downwelling and converging, converging and downwelling. In the uh, equatorial regions, it's upwelling and so on and so forth. Here again, Oxygen going 0 to 100%, you can see the profile, you get hypoxic waters with saturation ha happening just above it. Excess nutrients from watershed are exported to coastal waters as we just mentioned. There is also the loss of subaquatic vegetation because of human activities and other reasons which also create uh, oxygen loss and so on. Concern that feedbacks could worsen deoxygenation and warming, so you have various activities that have feedbacks between them. Phosphorus release from sediment is can increase from I increased marine deoxygenation because of the various processes, uh, denitrification and so on. Increased biological production which uh, again increases marine deoxygenation which can increase N2O in production which is a very strong greenhouse gas 200 times uh, stronger than CO2 
and that can cause increased global warming and ha again have a uh, impact on uh, increased marine deoxygenation okay so these are things to keep in mind uh, there is also an impact of n to p ratio because the human released n uh, nutrients have a different n to p ratio than what is naturally what naturally occurs in waters sea waters coastal waters and this affects the species composition because the phytoplankton that have evolved have evolved to respond to the n to p ratios that occur naturally and we are seriously and rapidly perturbing this ratio as well so ecosystem perturbations can go down uh, down the food chain the other global warming acidification deoxygenation links are shown here atmospheric co2 is increasing which is causing warming which is increasing stratification and reducing ventilation of ocean waters and increased respiration is occurring including nutrients fisheries and other stressors coming in and that's leading to increased co2 in the water and acidification but reduced o2 and deoxygenation so the CO2 acidification is getting a lot of attention, deoxygenation is getting some attention, but the argument in the science feature article is that it's not getting as much attention as it should because it should uh, it would outpace, it could outpace the impact of acidification very soon if it's not already doing that. Just to conclude with some uh, action items, specific steps to slow and reverse deoxygenation will vary among locations depending on the cause of the problem, co-occurring stressors and locally specific capacities and demands. However, the general strategy for restoring the ocean's oxygen and minimizing the impacts of deoxygenation will require the following. Reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that cause atmospheric and ocean warming, which is part of the larger Paris Agreement. Reduction of nutrient inputs that exacerbate oxygen loss in coastal waters and semi-enclosed seas. These tend to be very local problems. Global agreements exist, but they don't directly address such issues. Uh, but one is tracking planetary boundaries and other ideas to look at how we are affecting coastal regions. Inclusion of climate change effects on in developing nutrient reduction strategies. Again, this is not explicitly represented in the Paris agreements yet. Alleviation of anthropogenic stressors that threaten resilience and increase vulnerability of marine ecosystems to deoxygenation. Good idea, but how to do that is not always so obvious. There are ideas of blue carbon sequestration, increasing marine uh, ecosystems, subaquatic vegetation and so on which have multiple co-benefits like increasing oxygen, reducing uh, impacts of uh, cyclones and storms and also uh, reducing erosion and so on or, and filtering the nutrients that come in from the land. Adoption of marine spatial planning and fisheries management strategies addressing deoxygenation vulnerabilities and the protection of affected species and habitats. The UN Decade of the Oceans is beginning to address some of these issues even though it tends to be focused again on mitigation and ocean carbon dioxide removal and so on. So one has to be careful about these particular issues. Recognition of ocean deoxygenation as one of the multiple climate stressors which should happen. Work to unify research management and policy actions in the coastal and open ocean across biology geochemistry and physics across problems of warming, acidification and deoxygenation and across academic industry and government and regulatory sectors. There are many related ideas, for example, the fish which are managed very locally and regionally, they don't stay in one place, they move around the coast, especially 90% of the fish get, tend to get caught in the coastal regions. So these connectivities of habitats and connectivities of deoxygenation processes and so on must be built into the management and policy actions as well. Okay, so I will leave that here and you can follow up on the reports and the paper which are very nice with lots of very nice references as well. Okay, see you next time.